It's KGW News at 5. Good evening. We begin here at 5 with the continuing impact of the pandemic on our lives. This afternoon, Jefferson High School in Portland announced it's reopening campus and returning to in-person learning on January 24th. It's one of many schools that was recently forced to go remote due to COVID. Meantime, in an effort to track the virus, the government website for free at home tests has launched a day early, but not everyone's happy about that. Our Pat Doris has talked with a couple of folks who are frustrated, Pat. Well, Laurel, that early launch was great for people who spend all day online. They were able to find out early and place their order, no problem. But what about folks who work all day away from computers? They were often left behind. Hopefully there will still be some tests left over when they find out that the site went online a day early. Word spread quickly among social media users this morning that the government website to order your free home COVID test was taking orders. Gina Lynch, a hairstylist, was one of many who did not find out until later in the day. I think it's a little frustrating um, for those of us that come in contact with the public all the time. She also thinks frontline workers should be, well, in front of the line to get these free tests. You know, I see kids from two years old to adults who are 85. And I really feel like us, it is our responsibility to know ahead of time before we come to work or anything else, you know, if we have it or not. White House spokeswoman Jen Psaki shrugged off the early launch. So uh, covidtest.gov is in the beta phase uh, right now, which is a standard part of the process typically as it's being kind of tested uh, in, in the early stages of being rolled out. But a beta test in front of the entire country? That pretty much looks like a full on launch. I checked the site. It's covidtests.gov, and sure enough, there it was, a live website. Below that, you'll find information about the free tests that will be sent to you, and if you want even more, there is a Frequently Asked Questions page. By the way, some of you asked us if you can order more tests because you have roommates sharing a home. The government answered that in the Frequently Asked section, and the answer is no. You get four tests. What if you live in a large or multi-generational house? Still no. Four tests. How do they work? Well, basically, you swab your nose, then expose the sample to some chemicals, and it tells you in 15 minutes or so if you are positive for COVID. But remember, it's a rapid antigen test, and those are not nearly as reliable as the PCR tests. In this clip sent to us by the University of Washington School of Medicine, Dr. Jeff Baird said there is a big difference in sensitivity. If you have a swab and there's about 100 or 200 viruses, just really just 100 or 200 viruses on that swab, we can detect that with a PCR. For a rapid test, an antigen test, there usually needs to be tens of thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands. And so there's just a lot more virus that needs to be there. And because of that, the best time to use your test is if you feel COVID symptoms often similar to a cold. That's when the test is most likely to detect the virus. If it's negative and you still feel crappy 24 hours later, test again. And Dr. Baird says that home test is not great if you do not have symptoms. A use that's not so good, though, however, is completely asymptomatic individuals testing themselves to see if it's safe to go have a family reunion or something, you know, or go to the theater or go to an event, uh, or go into close quarters. They, they, they really do not have the diagnostic power to suggest that. That beta rollout of the government website where you can order the free home test is getting more and more attention all the time. The New York Times reported that at one point during the day today, there was about 700,000 visitors to the site. I checked uh, 30 minutes ago and there were 600,000 at that point. So it's definitely getting noticed around the country now. Back to you. Thank you, Pat. Life-saving clinics are struggling right now. Because of the pandemic, low staffing is impacting kidney patients who need regular treatment. Galen Etlin has the big picture and shares what can be done locally. Frederick Wharton in Clackamas started dialysis three years ago. Three times a week, four hours a day. He was born with one kidney and this treatment keeps him alive. It takes the toxins out of your blood. But his main clinic, run by Fresenius Kidney Care in Northeast Portland's Hollywood District, closed in December because of low staffing. He has since visited two other clinics also struggling with staffing. Which I'm really nervous about, not just for myself, but for older people also. There's not an option to not 
receive a dialysis treatment. Kathleen Belmonte is Chief Nursing Officer for Fresenius, helping oversee 2,800 clinics nationwide. Our nurses are telling us they're exhausted. It is emotionally draining. It's stressful. So it has been a hard two years. It's a struggle for both patients and staff. Casey Stowell is Regional VP for Fresenius in the Pacific Northwest, looking after more than 50 dialysis clinics. She says four are temporarily closed right now, and Omicron is not helping. It's becoming even more challenging day to day. They're not alone. Labor market company MC predicts there will be a critical shortage of 3.2 million healthcare workers by 2026. What are the things that you need to move forward successfully? We need people to apply and come work for an industry that, that saves the lives of people every day. At the end of every day, you go home and you know you've made a difference in someone's life. Fresenius has set up nurse residency and university relationship programs to get more nurses into kidney care. It's also adding benefits toward existing staff's education and mental and physical health. Recruitment and retention so that we can try to solve the equation on both ends. And knowing it's a tough job, they say growth is also incentive. I started out as a secretary in a clinic 21 years ago, and the company helped support me on a career path. They can be a clinical manager. They can be a regional vice president someday. I think the staff's doing the best they can. Patients like Frederick Wharton hope clinics get more support soon, knowing life is on the line. Because eventually people are going to start not doing well from this. Galen Etlin, KGW News. An update now on a wrong way crash in Portland and how close to disaster it truly came. Early yesterday morning, a car going the wrong way on I-5 hit a semi truck head on by Terwilliger Boulevard. Today, police said the car didn't have its lights on and narrowly avoided crashing into several vehicles before hitting the semi. One of those other cars did crash while swerving to get out of the way. Police say it's, quote, miraculous that nobody was killed. The driver, 23-year-old Sequoia Wheeler of Idaho, was cited for DUII. Both the driver and their passenger were not wearing seatbelts. They were taken to the hospital but should survive. Police are investigating a deadly shooting in northeast Portland. One man was killed late last night at the intersection of Northeast Ivy Street and MLK Boulevard. There aren't many details about the shooting yet. Police say the man was dead when they arrived. Anyone with information should contact Portland Police. A local business owner is dealing with a double dose of misfortune. She lost one of her businesses in a fire and a second business was just targeted by burglars. Mike Benner spoke with that business owner. He joins us now. Mike, how is she coping with all of this? Well, Laurel, let me tell you that Jasmine Wynn is a remarkably strong woman. Most people would have waved the white flag if they were dealt the blows Jasmine's been dealt. The 44-year-old tells me she woke up Sunday morning to alerts of a break-in at pharmacy.com near Southeast 82nd and Powell. Jasmine and her husband raced over to their business and discovered a large hole in a front window. And surveillance video confirmed their fears. It showed somebody climbing through the window, then ransacking the place. As if that's not bad enough, listen to this. Jasmine owns Hillsborough Pharmacy and Fountain, out in Hillsborough, of course. It was one of the eight businesses destroyed in that arson back in early January. Here's how Jasmine explains all of this misfortune. I guess things happen. Sometimes we got we lucky, and then we have to get sometimes that unlucky. You know, that's life. That's life. How profound for someone who's experienced so much loss in a short amount of time. Just unbelievable. In the meantime, we can tell you there has been an arrest in the arson case, but no arrest in the break-in. Jasmine's hoping anyone with information will contact Portland Police. Laurel. We wish Jasmine a lot better luck in the near future. Thank you, Mike. It is election night in Newburgh. Two members of the school board there are facing recall. Chair Dave Brown and Vice Chair Brian Shannon. Around the start of the school year, the Newburgh School Board banned what is described as political symbols on school campuses, specifically singling out pride flags and Black Lives Matter signs. Then board members fired Superintendent Joe Morlock after he refused to enforce the ban. Voters have until 8 p.m. to turn in or mail their ballots. Depending on how close the election is, it could be several days before we know the results. Some families in a Bellevue, Washington neighborhood are waiting to get back into their homes after a landslide took out a house yesterday. 
Seven homes are still evacuated as crews work to secure the area and figure out what caused the slide. That is really something to see, isn't it? The homeowners of that collapsed house did survive, but they lost almost everything inside. They own a carpet cleaning company and run that business out of their home. It's not the house, it's everything that's in it. Yeah. It's the memories. Everything in it. They won't let us back in. I need to get back into our house. Oh, that is so sad. There was a, a water main break at the time of the slide, but it's unclear if the break caused the slide or if the slide caused the break.